welcome to another episode of Mommy Needs a Break. It is a podcast for new moms who don't have it together because we ain't got it together. But that's all right. I'm Megan Thomas at Meg Scoop everywhere. And I'm Marisa Johnson at She Is Marisa J. Make sure to follow our podcast at MNAB Podcast. Um, and then make sure to visit our website at MNABpodcast.com. You can join our Patreon as low as $3. And you will get all the uncut, raw footage. Uh, just earlier, I was sitting with my baby in my lap, feeding her, just trying to put her to sleep so I could do this interview. <laughs> You would have saw that. <laughs> so make sure to check you us out. You're going to see the real our, deal. Right. Make sure to check us out on our website. Um, and who do we have today, Megan? Well, we got a very heavy show today, okay? It, to, this show is getting real today. We're going to be talking about the, the ice hysterectomies and more. But first, we have a dad guest today. We love our dad guests. He is a father of two boys, and he founded the Maternal Health Advocacy Organization for Kira for Moms in honor of his late wife, Kira Dixon Johnson, after she tragically lost her life uh, due to childbirth complications. So give it up for Charles Johnson, you guys. Yes, Charles, thank you for being here. We're so excited to have <laughs> you. Like, I think I first heard your story um, like in the news and I was like how can this be how can we live in a day and age where in America where women specifically black women are dying at at childbirth like that that does not make sense to me and and I'm so glad you're here to shed some light on that big issue with us today it's my honor thank you so much for having me um thank you for what you all are doing I think that using your voice, using this platform to really just empower mothers, empower growing families is so critical, right? And then take away all the stigma and what parenting, because the reality of the situation is we are all just trying to figure it out, right? Mm-hmm. And mama, dad, everybody, you just need a break sometimes. So I think this is brilliant what you're doing and I'm honored, I'm, I'm really honored to share with you all this afternoon. Well, thank you thank so you, much. Thank um, you. <laughs> now I know you have, we saw your one of your boys earlier. How old are they? So my boys are, uh, four and six, actually, Charles will be celebrating his sixth birthday tomorrow. So they're 18 months apart, man. And it is Whew. never, ever a dull moment with these two. But I'm, I'm tremendously blessed. They're amazing little guys. Are you guys having a COVID I'm, party? How are you holding up this pandemic? <laughs> Yo, so pandemic. So let me tell you, um, I, I, I'm I, digging deep into my trick bag, right? Like, I mean, I've, I've this summer, it was complete, like, because typically the blessing is over the past year and a half with my advocacy work, my travel schedule has been crazy. Um, and I really, just to be clear, this, this is a place of transparency, right? I burned a lot of guilt um, for the time that I'm away from my boys. Um, and so to be home has been a tremendous blessing. We had full on dad camp. I was every day this summer just to be with them and spend the amount of time we've had. Um, has been amazing now it's been difficult because we were limited so i'm digging deep in my trick bag i mean i was taking it back to chocolate i mean i was ordering slipping slides on oh. amazon <laughs> like yeah. i mean we have probably played two hundred thousand rounds of uno they've seen every classic 80s movie um <laughs> but just deep in my trick bag but it's been it's been a blessing you know making the transition now going back to school uh and having a kindergartner and a first grader doing virtual learning has its right. challenges, right? And keeping them engaged, but then also making sure that they're getting what they need out of this virtual learning experience. Yeah. So um, I have a couple of talents. Teaching isn't chief amongst them. So I'm really trying to sharpen my tools and make sure that I'm doing more than just some flashcards. And, okay, know, so wait, sure we, it. we typically do a mommy tip, but I feel like I want to hear from you because you got yes. your your schedule is full. You have boys. <laughs> I have a son with right. two. Yeah, and that yeah. is enough in itself. So I can't. I can only imagine what it's like to have two boys, like that young learning. So what are what's a tip? Give us a tip of something that you've learned <laughs> over the summer. So a tip. So my big thing, like my parenting style, is everything's a big deal. Like mm-hmm. everything's a big deal, right? Um, and people are constantly like, I'm, I'm so blessed. Like my kids are, 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 are smart, they're well behaved. Um, but my biggest secret is I'm a, just a big, excuse me, I don't know if I can, if this is appropriate, but I'm a big ass kid myself, right? Um, and I really, just enthusiasm is my biggest weapon, right? So if you 
if something, if you're doing something, it's a lot of positive reinforcement. It's, oh my gosh, like you, oh, it's, it, it, everything is big and it's over the top. And, um, you know, I think that, and I'll, I'll pivot. I'd like to share one for dads, like that they're possibly expecting or new dads. Um, the best advice I received when I was, uh, it's when we were expecting our first son, Charles, was a buddy of mine, not shout out, not name Xavier people. He was three kids in at the time. And he, it was so simple. It was so profound. We said to me, he said, look, he said, whatever she feels, the baby feels. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm, yeah. And so it's your job to protect her and make sure that she is happy, safe, and comfortable. Say it Period. louder. That is good. Period. Period. That's your job. Yeah. And that just stuck with me. Like, dang, whatever she feels, the baby feels. And that's your yeah. job. And that means, yeah. whatever that means, if that means running to the store in the middle of the night and getting the ice cream <laughs> to go with the, you know, with the Cheez-Its or whatever the crazy right. craving is, right. if it means there's something that y'all might be beefing about and it means you swallowing your pride, you swallow your pride, right? Yeah. Because ultimately it's bigger than you and it is about this tremendous blessing that y'all created together. So those are my 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 dad tips today. You that better say that, Charles. Right. That was a good tip. I'm I want to expect that. Every now, every now and then, every now and then, I come with, I drop a couple of jewels. But yeah, <laughs> that well, was good. good. Because we get big. I mean, those last couple months, it's like, oh my goodness, this is this is yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and anything you do will trigger me, and trigger. you better be on. And you just gotta, you. I mean, you got, you got to just be able to roll with it. Like you guys got to take the shoulder roll, take the punches. You know what I'm right, saying? And right. just, and just, and just, stay, and just stay in, and just oh. stay in, um, because the industry is gonna be just well worth the reward and then some. So, yeah, that was good. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> so this next segment is ain't no shame. Uh, it's our shameful mommy or daddy parenting moments where we don't judge each other. Um, so today, uh, my shameful moment is leaving your kid on their birthday. And um, so what I mean by this is, um, <laughs> you said birthday, I was like, oh, shoot. Uh, so my daughter, my daughter will be three, October 19th. My birthday is October 18th. So I essentially went into labor on my birthday. And, oh and, then, and then I have a, uh, how old is Aria? Aria six months. So <laughs> I feel like I've been pregnant for three months. I mean, three years, I'm sorry. <laughs> three years back yeah. to back. Um, every birthday on my birthday, I'm planning for my daughter Halo's birthday. So her first yes. birthday was the big birthday. I'm the day before on my birthday. I'm planning for this. Last right. year I had to come home early because she wants to go to Disneyland. So I had to prepare for a whole Disneyland day. And this year, you know, we're in COVID. I got, to, I just had a baby like right before COVID happened. Um, and I just looked at my husband and I was like, you're taking me to Mexico. Like you're taking me somewhere. Like I'm not doing this birthday thing this year. You deserve like, it. You deserve like, we, it. We play right. with the kids in the neighborhood every day. Like we'll yeah. see them when we get back. She thinks her birthday's every day. So I don't even know <laughs> like what that is. So I'm like, you know what, this year I'm just leaving. I'm leaving. My sister's going to watch the kids and I'm out and I don't care. And I have no shame in all of that. <laughs> Girl, she don't even know it's her birthday. Okay. Let's just be, let's no, start watch. there. She's not going to know. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a few, pa a few of my family members. I already know who are going to make me feel guilty when they find out like, and I don't care. And I'm saying it right now. I don't have any shame. But you know what? Most most parents don't celebrate the child's birthday on their birthday because usually they wait for the weekend. So it's technically. But that's the thing, and that's and she. You make such a great point. At this age, the birthday is whenever mommy and daddy decide to right. celebrate it. Right. So you right, good. Right. You can have you can have Mexico and you can have the party next weekend. Yes. That's done. That's <laughs> yeah, done. You can yeah, honestly, y'all. Well, I, I was I was about to take it too far. I was gonna say y'all could do Mexico and then Disney, but I thought about I forgot no. about the pandemic. Right. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. Again, I, I wrote it back. <laughs> no Disney. <laughs> No Disneyland. It's Disney. closed. It's closed. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. She asks know, every day, can she go to Disneyland? Too. And I'm like, I don't even know how we would do that anymore. Like, I don't know. Whatever. Oh, man. I ain't tripping. It's not <laughs> worth it. I'm telling you. It's, you deserve yeah. it. I am. I am yeah, like, do. I'm ready. I'm on Amazon right now ordering stuff. I'm I'm going crazy. It's, I want to <laughs> say this every because once you had Halo, I, like, and you went into labor on your birthday, I remember thinking like, 
you ain't never gonna have another birthday like your never. birthday is halo's birthday never so you deserve this you do deserve <laughs> to have to celebrate your own birthday for once in three years yeah yeah so that's <laughs> what i'm doing ain't no shame ain't charles no. you got any ain't any shameful moments oh man i you, yeah i got a couple the one that kind of just <laughs> comes to mind is so um kira and i will talk about kira in a little bit but we were huge travelers right and um we even with our first, our, you know, our, our first son, Charles, had his passport at six months old. It makes kind of, nice. if you're thinking about this. Um, and we traveled everywhere like we did all over Europe. We did Paris, we did Monaco, we did Colombia. I mean, he has tremendous, so, but, but so to that point, it's actually passed. It was so important for me to continue to travel with my boys, right? Um, and so <laughs> I, um, and it, a was like, well, you got to wait, you got to wait. And we had, it was my godson's birthday. Um, and, you know, they were doing a celebration for him in New York. And I think, what, so Charles was two, Langston was like six months old, right? And so I had the bright idea that I was going to take, but the boys like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fly to New York by myself with these two babies, right? <laughs> and I'm talking about, and typically that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. People who follow me on social media, I always kind of share these kind of Johnson family sketchy adventures because something all is inevitable. It always happens. Getting detained in countries like me and Kira always be something popping off. So fast forward, hit the airport. I'm talking about we are fresh. Everybody's got matching track suits. I got my dual <laughs> stroller. Like I've got my thing. I'm talking about hit this thing, ladies, with military precision. Bomb. Curbside. Check in. <laughs> through the gate. Yeah, expedited. Yeah. Boom. On the plane. Fresh. Early. Make the flight early. We're good, got snacks going, and we kick back. Kids are well behaved. Everybody's just in amazing. Who are these kids? They're like, I do. This is nothing, right? It's like, 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 I got this. Right. Got this. Yo, look. <laughs> the, here comes the plane. Landing gear comes down to land in the LaGuardia, right? I look over at Charlie and says, Daddy, I don't feel so good. Right? And it's, Daddy, I don't feel so good. <laughs> and he just, Oh. Projectile, projectile vomit all over me, all over little brother, all <laughs> over the lady in front of us. Oh. Like, I'm talking about that. So now we from just being so triumphant. So now I'm just like coming through LaGuardia, like this walk of shame. Just like, I'm talking about just covered <laughs> in vomit, right? And talk about the longest, the longest Uber ride ever. To our friend's place, man. But it's but it, at the end of the day, it's one of those things. It's just it's just a it's just a memory, right? But yeah. that's one of my shameful ones, man. Um, that, Wait, was it? Were, were people like like understanding and like, oh, let me help you? Or were they just kind of like, oh gosh? Oh, uh, uh, you know what? I think that I think that I I received a bit of grace because I was a single dad doing it by myself, right? And because my kids were cute and because they were well behaved, they were a little bit more tolerant, right? Mm -hmm. And had it been like, you know. Right, right. Had you been those people. Had I been those people, I'd be like, yeah. oh, it's okay. You need help. I'm like, I got this. I got this. I ain't have it, yo. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I got this. I ain't have it. We got so I, you know, my pride. I was like, I got it. No it's a problem. I'm like, and I'm just, you know, pulling out wipes and just trying to just like. Um, uh, but it got, at the same time, it just, it just tickled me because I'm like, Kira is, is, some, is laughing her off of this right now. <laughs> Right, right. Getting a, good, <laughs> getting a good laugh. Yeah. Oh, well, you got to keep the the blunder travel going. That's your family tradition now, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I would, I would like just one trip just to be normal. Just, I mean, I wouldn't mind just having some normalcy. I wouldn't mind it. It's, and then you're gonna be like, this is a boring trip, okay? That's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have yeah. a normal trip, and it's gonna be terrible. So. My grandfather used to say something all the time. He used to be like, you know, my grandmother, who was a complete firecracker, used to say, "Well, you could be different. You could have a, you could have a dull wife. You could have a dull family." And he's like, "Dull." He <laughs> That's like, a good perspective. His, his, no, but what his set, what, what his retort would always be. Dull ain't all bad. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> like, dull ain't all bad. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'll just take how I get it. It's, it's a memory one way or another. Amen for that. Ain't no Ooh. shame. <laughs> Ain't no shame in that. Ain't no shame. <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, it's time to scroll. Um, this is a segment where we talk about what's on our timelines. You know, you try to go take a break 
uh, when you go into the bathroom and you get on your phone and you start scrolling, well, this is, um, <laughs> that's what we do. And this is what um, has been on my timeline, actually, um, last week. Um, so you might have heard this story. There are women in ICE custody who are being forced in, to have hysterectomies. Um, it actually... I think there was a whistleblower, one of the nurses, uh, her name, what's her name? Oh, Don Wooten. She actually came forward to say that there is a doctor, a gynecologist who has been giving these women hysterectomies in ICE custody, at least 17 women. And sometimes without explaining what's going on or speaking to them in their native language and just kind of like, okay, you're going to get a hysterectomy. Um, and allegedly they've detained, or excuse me, denied treatment to some women who have cancer, brain tumors, breast cysts, and um, it has a history of policing their bodies. I think Should, even in this country, we know that black and brown people have had that history uh, put upon us, whether it's the you know, Tuskegee um, syphilis experiment or, or there, there's just a history of that, you know, the father of gynecology, he was he was using uh, slave women. Yes, you're mm -hmm. using slave women's bodies without their consent and not using any type of anesthesiology. So this is this is has been going on in our country forever. It's just a shameful thing to think about that it's happening now in 2020. Like, why is this happening in I would say in America in this day and age? Why do you guys think that? Charles, I'll let you go. I talk to you. Yeah, so this is, and I'm so I'm so appreciative uh, of y'all bringing this up, but this is a problem, y'all, and this is something uh, that I delved into on my Instagram live just last night. I had a brilliant woman by the name of uh, Monica McLemore, who is a, uh, a PhD a professor, and she's an RN, and she her whole study is in race relations and uh, reproductive justice, reproductive health. And we got into this, and there's so many layers to this, but it is a thing of, we talk about policing of women's bodies, there's also some accusations that even within ICE detention centers, they've actually been going as far as to track women's menstrual cycles. Yeah. Right? Um, wow, just things that. that are seen to sober first. And so we have to look at what's going on, not only in ICE, but on a broader scope. We talk about um, healthcare payment in this country, right? And so what I believe more than likely we're gonna find out is at the root of this, is that there are these perverse incentives for these doctors to perform these surgeries, right? So you come in uh, as a contractor and you are paid per service and there's a sliding scale of what you're gonna get paid. So it benefits you to run up the tab doing these surgeries, hysterectomies. And I'm sure if you look at what their reimbursement uh, scale is one of the most expensive things that, that contractor, that doctor is able to bill the state, or I'm sorry, for the federal government and the detention center for is a hysterectomy, right? And so That's there also becomes a broader issue amongst how brutal, how unjust this is, but how inhumane it is. And the question is, we talk about consent. When you are on, in this situation, you have to think about it from, this, from these women's perspective. You are in a foreign country, you more than likely don't speak the language. You have no idea when you're gonna get released. You're probably being denied communication with your family and your loved ones. And somebody comes and tells you, you need a hysterectomy. First of all, if you can comprehend what that is, I mean, what that means, do you have the, are you able to comprehend from the language barrier? And are, is that quote unquote under duress? You are a captive, right? That is the epitome of duress of, you know, of, you know, how can you, how can you do this? And to be able to, you know, snatch the most precious of gifts from these women is completely unacceptable. I live here in Georgia, as I know you do, Megan. So um, something's got to be done. We deserve answers. Um, and it's just, it is, it is, also consistent, this is something that has been going on. You talked about Dr. James Marion Sims, um, yeah. who is the father of gynecology, as you mentioned, um, practiced, uh, perfected his uh, obstetrical surgeries on enslaved women without their consent, without anesthesia. Um, even as, uh, as recent as 2013, there were uh, cases, we were seeing cases of forced sterilization of female prisoners in the state of California. Right. Right. That's and so this is something that's been going on. And just because people may have made certain life choices that have gotten them into situations don't mean that they should be, they, there still has to be a fundamental human decency um, 
that and 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 extreme consequences for people that are that are uh, taking advantage of these these women. That it's that's so sickening to me. So you're you're taking, and I think one of the stories is one of the uh, when I was reading this article, there was a younger girl. She's maybe early twenties. No, yeah. uh, how many women in their early twenties need a hysterectomy? It's very low. Right. So the fact that they're having like seventeen women at least that we know of that have had forced hysterectomy like that we know of that we know of right, right? right. so it it's just so sickening to me because it's like if you're gonna do that if you're gonna sit here and say oh let's give her a hysterectomy because it's the most expensive thing we can bill for i'd rather you lie about it okay ain't nobody checking hysterectomies in the trash that you threw away right they ain't checking for no uterus like let me count how many uteruses do you have that you've pulled out, right? So right. why don't you just lie about it? Just lie about it if you want to be that kind of a person. Don't well, take away somebody's because man, though, because, you know? can ha- because okay. they're they're worried about the consequences of the falsification of they, they, that's that's a great point. So let me think about what that says. What that says is they are more scared of violating the mm. written things than the humane things right exactly. they're more they're more uh, they're more scared of the investigation of falsifying those records than they are violating that woman's body and that says a lot it does because that means nobody's checking nobody's checking nobody's caring that they're doing this to these women so i'll just do that instead i'll just mess their lives up i'll take away their right to have children because nobody's going to come for me And then you have to wonder why the incentive is so high for hysterectomies, right? Mm -hmm. It's like with everything going on in the world right now, the black and brown people, you know, what, what better way to, to take a woman's uterus to not be able to reproduce, you know, like a a form of of genocide. Um, And I, and I, I'm doing a lot of, of reading on the womb and healing the womb and things like that. And it's already a problem in our community because there are ways to reverse you know, an unhealthy womb, but we're not taught right. those things. And, and black women aren't taught, you know, what we could re- what we could do to reverse those symptoms. Instead, the first resort is to take it out. And yeah. 90% or I think it was 80% of the times you can heal it, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. so that already in itself is an issue. Um, and so, so you have to wonder why, you know, well, why is it such a big incentive to take out? So I'll, I'll, and I hope y'all don't mind me going you know, kind of deep and a little bit dark right now. But so no, please do. Please I, do. I want to recommend for those of your, your uh, viewers that are watching this, if you want to learn more about this and about what's going on and the history of our, our, our country's deep, deep, deep dark history and taking advantage of black and brown people, uh, a book I highly recommend is Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. Mm. Um, it goes into this, this our, our shameful history in this country and how the... Um, medical establishment that is failing us was never meant to serve us in the first place, right? Yeah. So that being said, um, just stories that I could share with you all about, like you said, it is it is a form of genocide. That's such an important point. Um, there was a story that came out of, I believe it was Nebraska. This is, this is the, listen to this, this is in 2018. There was a set of nurses in labor and delivery that were profiling young African-American mothers that were coming in, particularly if they were on public insurance, watch this, and they were intentionally delaying their, um, uh, oh my gosh, their epidurals, right? Until it was too late because they wanted them to have the most painful, Mm. gruesome birthing experience possible in hopes that they would not come back and want to have children again. Because they saw them as being well, and because they saw them as being welfare mothers, and they didn't want them to keep producing babies. That was their form of policing these women's uterus, right? Um, it is, it, I, and I could go on and on and on. Um, but on some of the levels, and the other thing that I want to talk about briefly is, um, I don't know if either of you all, I mean, if you don't personally, I'm sure that you may know somebody that's very close to you that has had a baby that's had to have a stay in the NICU. Right, anybody? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So one of the other things we talk about, they're very much in in the in the medical establishment, what we would call perverse incentives, meaning that their care providers, doctors, hospitals are incentivized to do things that are not in the best interest of the patient. For instance, yes. the average NICU stay cost 
between $35,000 to $40,000 per day for an infant. Wow. Okay. And so what happens is, and we were having this conversation, I was having a conversation with some people who were trying to work towards this utopia for mothers and babies. And I was making some suggestions and they said, Charles, that's not going to work because if you do that, if we implement this technology, we implement these solutions in this way, it's going to reduce the number of days that babies stay in the NICU. And I'm saying that's our goal. So the problem is, but this is this, the problem is, it's going to get shot down by CFOs at hospitals because for them, that is a profit center. Yeah. They, need, they are incentivized the longer those babies stay in the NICU because mm-hmm. that's how they balance their books. Because it's not uncommon to have a baby leaving the NICU a million dollar baby. Right, right. Right? At $35,000 a day. Oh, yeah. So are they, so, are, what are they doing to prematurely allow you to have the baby? So they're not, so they're not, but the point is they are not, it's not in their best interest to provide care that ensures that your pregnancy uh, goes term. Got it. Right. Got it, got it, got or got it, got it. to make sure that they're addressing the social determinants or all the factors that we find right. that are contributing to premature births. Got right. It, got it. Got it. Because for them, so for instance, the way what we were talking about is there is a, a tech solution that will, um, that's being proposed that will help prevent maternal deaths. It will help us address um, premature births. I'm like, but it would be a thing that a hospital would have to bring in, and implement case right. by case scenario. And watch this. It would cost. This is this is what's wild. It would cost on average a hundred dollars per birth but the CFO of the hospital will shoot that down because ultimately he's looking at, well, if I spend this, he will, his excuse will be, I don't want to spend any additional money. But we know that the reason he's saying he doesn't want to spend the additional money is because it will take, it will lessen the number of $35,000 a day babies he has right. in his NICU. This is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy. Where are the women CFOs that have like five kids and can be like, nah, we're going to reduce this. <laughs> <laughs> reduce it and there's some people that are doing work but there's got to be a there has to be a fundamental overhaul of the healthcare yeah. system in america right. right we talk about reform we got to burn this thing to the ground man john q style and, and, and i say it, it all way, the time in a way in a way that is in a way that there's a service that puts y'all about to get me going but in a way that puts <laughs> patients over people right, right, right. I'm, so, I'm sorry i'm sorry patients over profits because it's the opposite right now um, yeah, right. You know, and, and it's so funny that you say because because I think about my own birth and like I went to the hospital, but I had a doula because I, you know my reasoning Shout for the doula. All the yes, yeah. they are so necessary, and the midwives out here. I, and I Absolutely. remember I, because I was so afraid. I was like, I don't know, you know, it's my first birth, and my mom might not be there, so like I don't know what to do. So I I hired a doula, and I'm I'm so grateful for that experience because it taught me a lot about having a baby and having a baby in a hospital. The first thing they do when you get there and they, you know, you're in triage or, and they're getting ready to put you in the labor delivery room, they put that, that, uh, what is it? The IV in you, not even if you need it, they put right. it in there and they don't even ask you, Hey, what do you, you just want the, lock, of, the what saline they about lock? To send up in there? What they about to do anything? They don't even say, hey, we're just going to put the saline lock here in the event you need an IV. They don't say that. They just go ahead and give you an IV unless you say otherwise. And to me, it's like, well, why would you do that? Because A, that's more money (laughs) for them. That's an auto. (laughs) You got to charge for the person putting the IV in, then you got to charge for the materials, right? And then B, it's like... It's a longer labor. I mean, it's it's been documented that when you do have epidurals or you do have stuff pumping in you, it does make the uterus tend to not go as fast as it should when it's pushing the baby out. So that just means a longer stay, longer money, longer time. Like, it, it's it, to me, it's just absurd. Like, why are you so concerned about that? Why is it that I have to tell you, don't cut my baby's cord until the blood stops pumping? Why would you cut it before then? Oh, because it takes too much time. I got to sit here an extra minute or two to wait till I got, a, I got a tea time. <laughs> right so i gotta wait no it's easy. he's not gonna die i'll just cut the cord right no why why does everything benefit you as a a hospital and not for me as a patient and my child that's what angered me so much when i found that out so i'll tell you another one that'll that'll blow your mind if you go back and look at it y'all might be familiar with this is they actually bill you 
that is line item. I'm, if you see it, if you if you have your medical records, you were more than likely billed for skin to skin time with your baby. Shut up. What? Shut up. Shut It'd up. It'd be a line item on your labor and delivery bill. Four hundred dollars <laughs> skin to skin. Something ridiculous like that. A couple How? hundred dollars for you to have skin to skin. Because these people get away with it, right? They get away with it. They bill you for skin to skin time with your child. <laughs> you, no, you better pay hospital. me for that, okay? I had to take Come that on. time. That was my. I had now to do I that really want to go look. Now I really want to go look. Please do. Please go look. I think that'd be a great follow up for like, yeah. yeah. Skin That's to absurd. skin. That is absurd. Then it's funny you say that. Or, or put I, that question out there. People see that. Yeah. Right. It's funny you say that about the IV because right when I, for, with my second child, um, they did that and they shot something up and it burned my whole hand. Like my whole hand was numb and was burning. I was like, what is that? I was like, take that out now. She's like, no, you need, I don't know. I don't even know what she said. I was in labor. Didn't know what, didn't tell you but so, but she took, my husband wasn't even in the room. And I was like, take that out of me now. I don't need any pain meds. I'm fine. Right. I didn't take ask it you for out. that. <laughs> whole hand was just burning on fire like can a sister get a warning like no no so um. <laughs> there's there's so much there's so much to this yeah. um but you talk about something i want i want to pause right here and just talk a little bit about the topic of informed consent right and what you both described to me in your own lived experiences what should not be happening um, particularly to birth people, but to patients, period, but happens far too often, particularly to people of color. And so informed consent basically is the idea that shouldn't be an idea, it should be a common practice that in the patient's bill of rights, a patient has the right to understand and be informed about all the options at their disposal, right? Yeah. Including the option of just doing nothing and what those mean. Yep. Far too often, doctors act and they operate with this infallibility and they're making decisions for you versus making decisions in partnership with you. Yes. And that's how care should be administered, right? Yeah. They are making, um, they are making, and oftentimes there are perverse incentives and they are making decisions that are in the best interest of them and their institution, right? their incentives. And then even we talk about there are all types of perverse incentives for the number of things that are prescribed. And things, but the thing is too, like you said, um, in extended states, they have to keep you there, but they can't keep you too long because at a certain point, your insurance will stop paying. Yeah. Right. And it's like, you can be sick, but we can't have you too sick because you're too sick. You're going to bankrupt us. So it's, um, it's a, it's a deep, 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 dark, dirty game. Yeah. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do to turn it around. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I think it's that's important as, as black people, we do need to be our own advocates and we need to be educated or get someone who knows what they're talking about when it comes to these things. Because like I said, if if I hadn't had my doula there, I, do you do understand? I would have had, they would have, I think I, I had my baby within 30 minutes of arriving at the hospital. Wow. So had she not been there, they would have been like, wait, hold up. We got to put the, the, the IV in you. We've got, like, like they would have been trying to stop right. the natural process. Right. right. Exactly. Right. Because that time. would, and, so, and, but when they saw her, they were like, oh, well, we can't really pull a fast one because you know, doulas know what they're doing. So it's kind of like, well, okay, we'll, we'll let you do that handle it because yeah. we know we can't just say whatever and do whatever. So like, it just makes my blood boil to think that we're still dealing with this, you know, and, and, and Charles, like what you've had to deal with, especially with, you know, I'm sure you're like any other dad, you love your wife, you love your kids, you know, you go to the hospital, you are, you know, you're expecting to come home with your wife and your baby, not even, it's not even a thought that that wouldn't happen. Um, on the day that, that Kira had your second son and after she had her C-section, what what did she say to you about how she was feeling and what was the doctor's and nurse's response? Um, it was um, complete apathy, right? Um, there was no sense of urgency. There was no humani humanity. There was no, uh, I'm, I'm still very much unclear about a lot of the things that happened that afternoon, 
What I'm very clear about is there was a complete failure for the people that were responsible for Kira's life to see her in the same manner that they would see their own daughter or their wife or their sister. Um, and there was a huge disconnect. And so you have to think for those of you who may not be familiar with Kira's story, she went in for what was supposed to be a routine scheduled C-section and was allowed to bleed internally for 10 hours um, while we begged for help and our cries fell on deaf ears. And this is a woman that walked into the hospital, um, not just in good health, but in, ex but in exceptional health, um, delivered a baby that was, the baby wasn't in danger. Um, and then we just found out so many things. And even, all, even up to the point, I'll just give you an example. And I won't go through the whole story with you in the interest of time. Uh, but as far as the level of apathy, so went in for the procedure at two o'clock, realized that she was bleeding at four, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. They didn't take her back to surgery until after midnight, right? Mm -hmm. The whole time her condition is deteriorating. The whole time I'm asking for help. The whole time I'm saying, when are we taking her back to surgery? When are we right. taking her for a CT scan? Help up. And everybody's like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, getting dismissed. All the way up to the moment that they finally made the decision to take her back to surgery. Mm -hmm. We're walking down the hall. Kira's holding my hand. She's telling me, baby, I'm scared. And I'm doing, the only thing I know to do as a husband is... Mm -hmm. Just trying to stay calm, tell her everything's going to be okay. And this is what the doctor said to me. Um, and I, it just gives me chills every time I think about it, every time I actually articulate it. He said, it's not a big deal. Sometimes <laughs> it's not a big deal. Sometimes these things happen. I'm going to go back into the same incision I made earlier for the cesarean I'm going to find out what's going on. I'm going to fix it. She'll be back in 15 minutes. The doors of the operating room open. They closed behind her. And that was the last time I saw Kira alive. When he went in and opened her up, there were three and a half liters of blood in her abdomen before she'd been able to deteriorate and bleed internally all day. Um, and her heart stopped immediately, right? And so you have to ask yourself, would that have happened if she was white, right? Yeah. Um, and then compounded by that, right, is the lived experience of myself as a black man, as a black father. And I, I don't know either of your husbands, but I would venture to guess if you were to put them in my shoes, you would be like, oh, they would go off. So... Picture this the entire time Kira is suffering and I am reaching my point. Literally Kira is saying, baby, please, please stay calm. Because she knew even at her most vulnerable point that if mm. I raise my voice, if I slam my fist on the counter, if I grab the doctor by the collar, then as a black man, I would immediately be seen as a threat and now security would be called, police would be called. And so she, in, in that moment, in her most vulnerable time, she was concerned for my well, being as a black man, right? Because she knew how it would be perceived. Um, and I'll tell you all another thing that I don't really share a lot publicly. The night before we went into the hospital, so keep in mind, this is the second time around for us. So this is supposed to be a walk in the park. It's supposed to be a cakewalk, right? Um, we got our bags packed. We ready to roll. We've done the whole over buying, over preparing, you know, and like this, we, we pros this, we got this. Plus this is a scheduled C-section. Right. Got this. <laughs> Sweats packed, you know, Air Max, like jogging suit, like we're good. Comfort, comfort and function, right? Because we've got to be at the hospital three days. We're going to be back at the crib and we're going to go. The night before we're going and we're getting ready for bed, Kira's in the bathroom and she's in the mirror. And she turns around and she says, baby, she says, she says I want to look really pretty for Langston tomorrow. She went in the closet Instead of her jogging pants and her sweats, she pulled out a dress. She pulled out her earrings and all her jewelry. And she laid them out. And um, I went in the closet and I, uh, I pulled out some slacks and a button-up shirt and some loafers. And jokingly, but halfway jokingly, I said to her, I said, let me get my stuff together. And this is what I said. I said, because you'd never know when you need to look like you have a little bit of money and a little bit of sense. Mm -hmm. Having no clue that none of that would matter. Because at the end of the day, no, it didn't matter how I was dressed. It didn't matter what kind of watch I had. It didn't matter. My shoes didn't matter. They saw me 
as a black man and they saw my wife for all the languages she spoke, for all the degrees she had, for all the amazing things that she accomplished, they saw her as just another black body mm. that was not a priority and was not seen as human. Hmm. I'm sorry. Whew. This is this is tough. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to you, Charles, that you've had to deal with this. This is so painful. You know that this is a this is a black story over and over and over again, you know. Whether it's mothers going to have babies and then there's no health problems, whether it's Black boys in a car, you know, just going, just going to the store. A father selling loose cigarettes on the street doesn't make all, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's it just, it's so painful to think, like, we ain't safe anywhere. Yeah. At the hospital, that's like the safest place to be. They heal the sick, you know? And so I, I just want to applaud you for, for this journey that you've been on because it's, like to to think of that you're a father, you now had to go home with a brand new baby, and you already had a toddler there, you yeah. know, and you've you've taken on this this advocacy, which is so heavy, and you do it with grace. And so I just want to Thank applaud you. you. Thank you. Thank you. No, for Thank sharing you. this story, for making sure that people do not forget Kira's story, so that you know this doesn't happen anymore. And I'm so grateful to you. And, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, you know, you've been working with Congress to pass legislation. Um, I think it's the Maternal Death Act. Yeah. Um, and that got passed. So can you talk about like, what is that? What, what does it include? And how does that affect mothers? Having sure, babies? sure, sure. So um, I was extremely, extremely honored to um, work with a truly bipartisan uh, coalition to pass uh, the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act. So the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act, um, and I'll tell you the kind of the quick arc of this. When I first started sharing Cure's story publicly and it began to get attention, people started to talk about this issue because you have to keep in mind, when Kira passed away, I thought that what happened to my wife in 2016, a woman walking into a hospital who did everything right, who has access to care, who's healthy, not walking out to raise her boys. I thought that she was a complete anomaly. I thought this is something that doesn't happen in this day and time. And what happened is I began to hear other stories. And I'm like, hold on, something's not right. That's why I did the research for myself. And I found out that we are in the midst of what truly is a maternal mortality crisis. More women die in the United States than any place else in the civilized world. 800 women are dying every single year. 50,000 women are experiencing what are called near miss events, meaning they went into childbirth and they nearly died, but they survived. The CDC has determined yeah. that 60% of those deaths are preventable. Yeah. So these are mothers like Kira that should be here, that should be at first days of school, that should be at graduations, they should be dancing at weddings, right? And so I was blown away that this was happening, but I was even more struck by the fact that nobody was talking about it. How is this right. America's dirty little secret? And on top of that, African-American women are dying five times as often as their Caucasian counterparts. How? How is this happening? So I made the decision to speak up and um, Kira's story really began to resonate with people. And honestly, I'm very private. Um, I really thought that I, if I was lucky, I might do a couple of interviews and people might begin to pay attention and but I thought honestly I would go back to being a soccer dad and raising my boys in obscurity and just trying to figure figure that part of life out but God and Kira had very different plans for life so fast forward as I was advocating I was like okay I got to figure out how I can create substantive change and so I found out about this piece of legislation HR 1318 the Preventing Maternal Death Act it was written and it was introduced to Congress by an, um, a white Republican, interesting. This is an interesting part of the story mm -hmm. that white people don't know. Out of out of uh, Washington State, named Carolyn uh, Herrera Butler. When I first found out about this piece of legislation, there were 18 co-sponsors on this thing. Those are all who may not be familiar with the way politics works. That ain't nothing. 
right? Literally, they they didn't have nothing. It was going nowhere. Everybody said that this is something that'll never get passed. It doesn't have the support. And they said that women's health issues just aren't a priority. And I was like, well, I was crazy enough to think that maybe I should try. So I started going, I started lobbying, started talking to people, started, and we started gaining um, support. They told us that, they were like, this is cute. You're getting attention, but yeah, we need 150 co-sponsors to sign onto this bill before we take it seriously. I came back to DC with 180. Right. Wow. Um, then they said, "Ah, oh, well, you know what? Uh, it's too divisive. We'll never get this done. And, you know, it's polarizing and nobody really wants to touch women's health issues. And so we had to reframe this conversation that women dying in childbirth, it's not a women's health issue. It's a human rights issue. Right. right? right. Yeah. Women in this country, regardless of background, class, creed, you know, how they identify with their sexuality, deserve the right to survive childbirth, period. And so we were able to reframe it in that context and we pushed the issue and we jammed it down their throats. And I'm proud to say that like literally 2018, the day before President Trump shut down the government to get, because he was pissed because he didn't get the funding for his wall, mm -hmm. he signed this bill into, into, into office. So what it so does, and that's a it? very, Trump signed it. <laughs> Trump signed it. So yeah, all right, so I'm gonna go there because this is family, right? Go there. Another part go of the story. This is, this is another part of the story that people don't, that people don't know. So. I'm also very proud that this truly was a bipartisan um, effort. We had Republicans, we had Democrats, we had people really coming together and realizing that this is bipartisan, right? There's, I mean, you talk about your constituencies with the people in America that care about mothers and babies. And that's why I had to get them to realize, and this is why I would go into their office and I would say, I would go in there on my Nino Brown, like, look, <laughs> either you're going to sign on to this bill you're talking about your constituency. Like, I don't want to hear your reasons why not, because there are two types of people in this country. Either you are a mama or you got one, period. Right. Right. right? right. And explain to your constituents why you don't think that mothers and babies are a priority. Right. Signing it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> what happened was, um, you know, it got delayed and there was a lot of political back and forth. And so finally we had the opportunity to come and I had the opportunity to go to DC and testify before Congress and um, which was truly an honor to kind of speak on behalf of the families that had uh, lost mothers behind this issue. And we came out of there and then got passed through the house. It got to the Senate, it got passed. And now it ends up on President, Trump de President Trump's desk. So, all the Republicans that I had worked with are saying, oh, Charles, he's going to sign it any day. He's going to sign it. So this is um, early November. And I'm like, all right. So a week turns into two weeks. He hadn't signed it, right? Now, end of November is coming. And now there's all this heckling back and forth between him and Pelosi mm -hmm. about this wall and the funding for the wall. And he still hasn't signed the bill. And I'm like, yo, what's up? What's, what's, and they're like, don't just be cool. He's going he's gonna to sign it. Now it's December. And so I think it was the second week in December, he drew a line in the saying, he's like, look, if I don't get the funding for my bill by December 18th, I'm shutting the government down. Like, and what I knew that meant for this bill is all those trips to DC, I had probably taken 15 trips to DC on my own dime, right? Wow. Stalking people in the halls to get them to sign this bill. Um, all the blood, sweat, and tears, not just myself, a lot of other people, a lot of other advocates really poured their everything into getting this done. Um, that meant that all this was going to go out the window. And I was just, I was extremely frustrated. And so I woke up, I think on the morning, I think it was December 18th or 19th. And I like went to social media. Here's the deal. Regardless of how you feel about uh, President Trump, the one thing that we can agree on about him is he loves social media, right? The thing about his love for social media is that makes him accessible. So I went to social media and I said, look, um, I need everybody to at the president on Twitter, on Facebook, on Pinterest. I don't care where you hit him up at on his black planet page. I don't care where you hit him at. <laughs> um, and tell him and tell him that he needs to sign the preventing maternal death act. And he needs to do it today. Right. Mm. And I'm proud to say that at 6 PM yes. on December 19th, before he shut the government down, he signed that bill into, yeah. into law. Hey, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And as we talk about, you got to apply pressure, right? Man. Yeah. You know, Charles, Char you 
Wait, wait, hold on. I do want to. Oh, I want to ask yeah. you something. One more thing about that. Sure, what, sure, sure, sure. What What is in that bill? Excellent question. So I'm sorry. I did all that. I did all that okay. fluff and didn't talk <laughs> about the substance. Okay. So <laughs> let me let me let me jump in. Right. So what this does? Excellent question. So let me give you the the quick and dirty about this bill. So what this bill does is it creates federal funding for the CDC to fund what are called MMRCs or maternal mortality review committees in all 50 states. All right. So now what will happen is if somebody dies, if a woman dies in childbirth or child or from childbirth related complications, anywhere all the way up to a year after birth, there will be a committee that reviews and investigates that woman's death, mm -hmm. collects the data surrounding her death in a standardized manner, right? So the reality of the situation is we cannot address the problem if we don't understand it. And not only this is women are dying, but women are dying and we're really not clear about any of the factors that are going into it. Was it a C-section? Did she hemorrhage? Did she have a history of fibroids? Was she, you know, was she, did she have hypertension? What type of, what type of hospital was she at? What type of care did she have? Did she have a midwife? All these factors in a standardized manner, right? Even if something as simple and the way data works, to give you an example of how important it is to collect data, even in a standardized manner, it sounds boring, but it's critical, right? When Kira passed away, in the state of California, which is a progressive state, there was no place on her death certificate that even indicated that she was pregnant. Oh, wow. Right? Right. So it's about how do we standardize that? How do we better understand these root causes so that we can address the problem? It also provides a lot of other funding. Um, I think we had an, an additional $50 million appropriation for uh, training and uh, and implicit bias stuff. So it does that, but mostly it is to address and understand and collect the data and be able to provide the resources in all 50 states to investigate every single one of these maternal deaths. Yeah. And with that, uh, with that data, does it really hold the hospital accountable? So like if a mother does die, no, that's the no. next step. That's, that's the it's, next, it's step, next step. Huh? Okay. That's the next step. So it is, it is um, this bill is not the fix, but it is yeah. an important start. It's an important start for our country to recognize that there is a problem and take steps in the direction of a solution. But it is not the step, but I'm sure that it gives me a segue to what's next. So um, I was honored to work with uh, the Congressional, uh, so the, the Black Maternal Health Caucus, uh, which is led by uh, Representative Alma Adams and Representative Lauren Underwood. And in March, just before COVID took over the world, we went back to Congress and introduced nine more bills, not one, not two, not three, but nine bills addressing the maternal mortality crisis from every aspect. So now we're going yes. back, we're reducing, like we talk about doula care, providing funding for doula care, providing funding for um, community-based uh, health organizations led by black women, providing, there's a whole bill in there that talks about the ways that tech can um, influence this. And within that, we talk about accountability. So within this package of nine bills is something I'm extremely proud of, which is the Kira Johnson Act. Yes. And what the Kira Johnson Act will do is provide funding um, for uh, workforce diversification. Uh, it will mean that we will see much, many more uh, black and brown chocolatey faces in our workforce. But very important, we talk about, watch this, and they all gonna dig this, right? So from an accountability standpoint, one of the problems we have is that people go into these situations and there is no place for them to voice their concerns. There is yeah. no accountability. Yeah. So what the Cure Johnson Act will do is it will provide funding to create independent quality of dignified care offices within hospitals. Very key point is these will be independent quality of care offices, compliance offices within hospitals that are independent from hospitals. So okay. you go into a hospital, you're discriminated against, you feel that your care wasn't up to standard and you feel any of these things, regardless of, you have a place to report that incident that is at your service, that is within the hospital, and then the federal government is gonna publish that data. You know what's, and, and this is kind of off That's topic, good. but, but yeah. what you're saying is really putting the power back in the people. And I feel like when we have the power and we're informed, we act completely different, right? And yeah. they right. treat us different. Um, with my first child, like, 
I knew I didn't want to do vaccines, but I didn't really have the knowledge. So they punked me, right? They punked me into right. a corner. I was crying. This time around, I, I hired a whole different doctor outside of my network. He worked yeah. with me and my husband. He went through all the data with us and he let us decide what we wanted to do. He equipped us with the knowledge. So then when I went into the doctor most recently with my newborn, with my newborn, um, I told them straight up before I got there, I'm getting these shots. Don't ask me about any other shots or I'm changing doctors. They let everybody <laughs> know. It was a total different experience yes. than the first doctor. Because when I yes. went in there, they didn't even try me. They did not try me. So when you give people this, the information. Informed and, and empowered. Right, yes. Right, you have so much more confidence. When I tell you my first child, I was in the corner crying. Like I had no mm. hope. Like yeah. you're going to tell me all these things about my kid. And then with my second child, it was like, don't try me. And they right. did not try me. They didn't they, even bring knew. it up. Because right, you knew right. you had the information. So I thank you for that. Because yeah, it's like the more knowledge we have, the more confident we become, you know, because yeah. nobody tells us that we can't. That we can't back. tell them no. Right. They're right. like, oh, it's yeah. the right. doctor. They know stuff. So I'm right. just going to let them do they're it. They're infallible. Right. They're informed. All yeah. those things. Um, oh. You know, and I think that. And that's my biggest thing at the end of the day is, you know, I, I hear so often people hear these stats, they hear Cure Story, they hear all these horror stories about birth and they say, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I'm so scared to have a baby. And that breaks my heart because yeah. that's not right. what I want. Yeah. But what I, because it should be the happiest time of your life, right? And it should be a time that you're able to celebrate. So okay. my goal is always to just like, no, 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 no this is going to be beautiful, but let me empower you and inform you so that you know what to do. And then now that your support team can understand how they need to support and advocate for you if you're not able to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to do is just build a country of informed, empowered, particularly black and Brown people um, in this day and age. And I think all people, but this is, these are, these are issues that they're not, while, while they are disproportionately affecting our community and cause of co communities of color, they're not unique to it, right? Yeah. Um, they're not, they, this is all mothers are at risk. This, our, our medical system is failing all mothers right. and all families. Well, let me ask you this, Charles, what is, what's next for, for Care for Moms and how can our viewers and listeners help? Uh, man, I really, I'm just gonna burn the whole medical system down to the ground. And um, right. anybody, that's, anybody that's got a thing full of matches, <laughs> and, you know, a closet full of matches, welcome to join me. Um, but in all sincerity, man, um, you know, I have this kind of utopian fantasy of being able to fix all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Of a time sooner than later that we won't continually hear these stories of women, particularly Black women, dying in childbirth. Um, and we're going to continue to stay on the front lines and fight until we talk about this maternal mortality crisis in the, in the historical context. Um, I think beyond just the maternal mortality crisis, I really um, identify not just as a maternal health advocate, but a patient rights advocate. And so today actually is uh, World Patient Safety Day. Um, hey. People may not know that a couple of statistics I'll share with you all is that 4.5 million people die every single year globally from medical errors. Right. That's crazy. 200,000 people in the United States every year, medical errors and neglect. Um, and that medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Mm. Um, so we have a lot of work to do as far as accountability, uh, particularly I know that you're in California. In California, um, it's compounded because we have a uh, medical board that is letting doctors literally get away with murder. Um, on a continual basis and not disciplining them and talking about accountability. And on top of that, we have something called the microcaps. And for your listeners in California and all across the country, this is going to blow your mind. In the state of California, the value of human life has been set at two hundred fifty thousand dollars since nineteen sixty five in instances of medical of medical malpractice and negligence. So, what oh, that means, God. if you walk into a hospital and they accidentally <sighs> amputate the wrong leg, $250,000. If you go into a, go in for, um, to get your tonsils out and they give you too much anesthesia, $250,000. Hmm. 
the value of human life has been set at $250,000 in cases of medical negligence. It's crazy. And so what's happened is mm. that, is that what's happened is, what's happened is, is that the medical malpractice providers have spent hundreds of millions of dollars buying off the California legislature to keep these laws in, in place. It's sickening. And so um, in, in 2022, we're going to take this, talking about power to the people. So instead of going to the legislature, um, we've qualified this for the ballot. We're going to put the power in the people's hands. So when people go to vote in 2022, they're going to be able to vote for the, um, for the, um, the uh, FIPA, the Fairness for Injured Patients Act, and uh, put the power in the people's hands so that it'll get, do away with these caps. And then a jury will be able to decide. Um, yeah. And what happens with this is that families aren't even able to get attorneys because nobody will take the case because it will cost more to fight the case than it will than is recovable. Exactly. So, so how are doctors ever going to be held accountable? Right. right. Now, 250, Crazy. 250 days is nothing for them. So it's almost like going against <laughs> I'll take the, the police, fine. Give me the fine. The police commission when a wrongful death happens with a police officer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so to that point, I'll give you an example. There's a woman that actually worked at Cedar Sinai. They crushed her baby's skull with forceps when they were delivering him. Mm. Never will function. He is in a relatively vegetative state. He's bound to a wheelchair, $250,000 won't even put a ramp outside of her home and get the right. van that she needs. So what does that do for this woman? She had a career. She was a tax paying citizen contributing. Now she cannot do that. She has to go to public assistance mm. to be able to care for him. Right. It's insane. And she can't afford a caretaker. So she has to be his full-time caretaker. Wow. Nobody would take nobody would take her case. Ooh. Every lawyer go... in California told her no. Mm-mm. I'm no, about to we go fight. Touch, we're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. It's not worth our time. <laughs> this, uh, this makes me want to fight. Like right now, honestly, yeah, it's like, crazy. whatever you have going on, please keep us in the loop because I will. Please, I will. Yes, I will. this is like this is this is too close to home. Yeah. You know, like the yeah. example you said when you said you know, put your husband's in my shoes. And, and that's what like crushed me because he would have been the same, he would have reacted the same as you, you know, and he would have to think about, okay, if I do this, if I do that, if I do this, I'm going to be perceived like this. And, and that's not how an experience is supposed to be. That's not how childbirth is supposed to be. No, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll say this and I'll let you, I'll let your listeners, um, kind of decode it. So there is a very high profile celebrity who has shared her story very publicly about nearly losing her life in childbirth. Um, The real deal behind what happened with her and the reason that she survived, she demanded time and time again that she needed to go for a CAT scan and something wasn't right. The only reason that she got taken back to to get the service that she deserved is because she had a white husband Mm -hmm. that was a billionaire that went out in the halls of the hospital and said, if you don't take her back right now, I will burn this place to the ground and spend every dime I have ruining you. Mm -hmm. Fix it. Even in her, on the crown that she sits on, and the throne that she sits on, she was still denied service and it took her white husband intervening for her life to be saved. That's a shame. That's crazy. It's just that another like... thing to add add to the list. And we keep saying like it's 2020, but girl, it's it's 1965 still. Okay, that's what I'm. <laughs> that's what I'm. 2020 is 1965 all over yeah. again. Um, Charles. So as you're saying all of this, I'm really getting political vibes from you. Are you gonna run for office? Absolutely not. <laughs> That's what I, to, I was thinking. No, that because, too. No, saying, because we need somebody like you, and you are nah. like so informed. No, nah, listen, that is you. that is a I will vote that for is you. a that I is a that is vote. right. That is an ex- that is a that is an extremely high compliment, and I appreciate it, and I really do receive that. But nah, um, I am I like uh, being able to take a scorched earth approach. I think that 
Yeah. The thing, excuse me, that makes me effective as an advocate is I'm not beholden to anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I, I promise the families that I am of service to, I'll never sell you out. Um, mm. I'll never compromise and I'll never back down. And okay. I never want to put myself in a position. And that's one of the things I'll be honest with y'all. And I'm unapologetic. I go, I like, there should be a coffee table book about the things that I say when I go to Capitol Hill. I, I open meetings in Nancy Pelosi's office telling her how much I hate politics. Right? <laughs> and I say things, but, it's, but that's what makes me effective. I tell them, like, yeah, I, yeah. I, this is, I think it's bullshit. And yeah. I think that, but this is why I'm here. And I think that it makes me, it makes me dangerous and effective. And I feel like I'm best served being an advocate and a voice for the people and using the platform that I have to fight. And like I say, if we fix, like this is, I feel like this is what I'm called to do. Like if we fix this, then we're going to take on, we're going to just, we're going to keep fighting, you know, wherever there's a fight that needs to be had. So. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I keep up the good fight, you. Charles. Yes. <laughs> we'll vote for you. We'll be- <laughs> oh man. Maybe one of my, one of, I, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, another family thing. I was speaking about family. I, I, I tell people, I, I retired from politics in 1985. One of the things, um, and y'all, can, yeah, how old are you? Watch, I'm about to tell you. I'm about, to, I'm about, to, I'm, about to, I'm about, so I'm about, I'm about to share something I've never shared in any interview that I've ever done. Right? I'm about to share something with y'all that I've never, that I've never shared with any interview that I've done. So, my dad ran against John Lewis in 1985 what? in his congressional seat. What? And I was out there campaigning as a five year old. That's all I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Never against. That's, Smile, my, that's, boy. The, that's the that's the joke as a family. Like, uh, I gotta give out another bumper sticker. Nah, man. Um, I'm out here putting up yard signs, man, in the Georgia oh, heat. Oh, so you, you did your you did your your. I did my you paid your dues. You paid your dues. I paid so, my all dues, right. man. And rest in peace to to Congressman Lewis. We're just yeah. uh, yes, just such a such a hero, man. And he will be he will be missed. Um, yes. And there were actually some people who were talking about asking me that would I have any interest in it. No, thank you, but no thank you. Um, <laughs> if it's DNC, we'd love the DNC pick somebody else that hey. um, will, will serve. Anyone that can get Trump's, Trump's attention on social media, that's, hey. Hey, Donnie, yes. Donnie, All right. I'm, Donnie, I'm going to pull up on you. Get, I'm going to come see you, Donnie. Straight thank you up. so Yes, thank you. That was from Senator Charles Johnson of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, we got one more segment before we get out of here. Okay. Yeah, this last segment is called mm, I'm Fine. Um, it's a little inspiration. We like to leave you to remind mommies and daddies that you are fine, um, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. Uh, so today, um, and I thought this was perfect for today, uh, it's our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And that's Ooh, Martin Luther King. Love that. um, and you know, every great leader in history has made the world better um, by expressing their, their concerns, you know, eventually starting a movement and, and, and ultimately leading to change. And I was having a conversation with one of my best friends last night. We were on the phone for five hours in. She was wow. checking on me and because I have a big, I have a big mouth. And I, I, when God shows me something, I always tell God, don't show me something unless you want me to say it. Cause he knows <laughs> I will go. say it. He knows yes. I will speak it. And I told her, I'm like, you know, me, you know, the more he reveals to me, um, the more I'm going to stand up and say something and I'm going to say it loud. And I never, and I told her this last night, I said, the day that I, um, shut things down because maybe it's not how I grew up. Maybe it's not what I was taught by my parents. Maybe it's not, um, you know, what made me into a woman. You know, like the day I shut something down because it's not my normal, like the day, like take, take me out because I, I don't ever want to think that I know more than someone. I never want to assume that I just know the way things are um, yeah. because who am I helping? You know, like, I truly believe that that God picks the people that he knows will go out there and tell his people, you know, and I commend you, you know, like for having the strength in you 
you know, with two yeah. little boys, like with all this going on, like losing your wife, like I could never imagine going through something like that with my husband. Like I could never imagine. Thank and the so fact much. that you have so much strength in you and you're still able to laugh and you're stable to, to raise those boys the way you do. Like, I just commend you. Like you are Thank a you. true leader. Like I am so proud of you like i am honored to even be sitting in here right now oh, talking no, right. Right. thank you, know, you so much like, that means so much like, you are like what our people need right now and i just i'm sorry that this had to happen like this but like yeah. man You're changing like, the world this is, you like right. truly thank are you so much. And, like the way you go about it like the way you said like you would never sell out like that's everything to me and so I just thank you so much. Gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. That means that that means so much. And I um, you know, I, I talk about often um, you know, my uh, one of my closest friends, and I don't even know if I just even the direct supposed to take this this segment. I'm sorry, I'll be messing y'all show all up. <laughs> I gotta chop this thing fine. up. But <laughs> you know, he uh he would say something to me, um and he just pissed me off because what he would say to me is he would say to me, um, he would say to me all the time, he would be like, look, man, um, God is using this to make you into who he always meant you to be. And for me, I heard that I used to get so irritated because yeah. what I heard was I had to lose my wife to meet my potential. Yeah. And it used to make me yeah. so angry. I'm like, no, like, what but what are you talking about and i'm at a point now where i receive that a little bit differently um because i'm clear that this path i'm clear that this is my purpose but this is a path that i would have never chosen for myself right yeah. it did have to choose me um and you know is it difficult is it you know absolutely did i ever imagine my life turn like this hell no um but you know and i appreciate all support i appreciate all those things but at the end of the day um you know selfishly like what drives me is being able to impact families and change the world all those things are important but at the end of the day like it's about my sons and it's about yeah they're coming a time when I have to have that conversation with them about what happened to mommy, right? At a time when they're old enough to truly understand and knowing their hearts and knowing how much their mother they have in them and just their spirits. I just, the thing that keeps me up at night, the thing that drives me is them asking me, well, daddy, what did you do about it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you do about it. And there's so many things that I can't change, but to be able to say like, no, nah, son, like, like we lost, but they didn't win. Right. And, you know, because of the sacrifice that your mom made, because of the work and the way that she has impacted the lives of people that she will never know, like this work will live on for generations. Yeah. And there will be mothers that, like I said, will get to be at first their schools and dance at weddings. And our nightmare would not be other people's reality. So that's what it's about. And that's uh, what, what drives me. And I'm so grateful. Like, you know, we talk about this, this, uh, this podcast and this, medium being rooted in parenthood and it is such a gift man um and i love the way that you all take a transparent approach and um keeping it real because it's important because you know those of us who've been you know blessed with this with these precious gifts like we need each other we need the energy we need the resources we need people being transparent we need sharing tips. we need all these things um to be able to raise up you know these gifts yeah. Well, thank you. Oh my goodness. I'm like, Charles, we can sit here and talk to you about this all day. Seriously. Honestly, because this is a topic that is so near and dear to y'all gonna us. run out of y'all gonna run out of tape. 
that's the age that's the age baby me coming out the tape y'all ready we had a tape flip it flip it b-side um what uh where can people reach out to you or find out more information about four care for sure sure so it's um uh the website is uh four care for moms.com it's kind of peculiar uh but i'm kind of peculiar so it's the number four k-i-r-a the number four M O M S. So four cure for moms and it's four cure for moms on all social media platforms. You can keep up with the work we're doing, the way that we are working to make the world a better place. And you can a lot of times keep up with me and the boys and whatever shenanigans we're into. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for listening and watching mommy needs a break and um, taking your break with us. We appreciate it because there's a lot of things you can be doing on your break, but you came here. So thank you. Um, make sure you follow for Akira for moms for more information um, about advocating for maternal health. I am Megan Thomas at Meg scoop everywhere and make sure you join our Patreon, become a patron and you can get exclusive footage and giveaways because we got a lot of stuff coming up really soon. Yes, and I'm Marisa Johnson. Make sure to follow me at she is Marisa J. Hey, we got the same last name. I just realized that. Hey, <laughs> talk about that. Connect these dots. Johnsons. <laughs> it's my husband. <laughs> follow Mommy Needs a Break at MNAB Podcast on all media outlets and make sure to visit our website at mnabpodcast.com. And we will see you next time. Bye. Ladies, thank you so much for having me. It's been a thank blast. you for thank joining you, us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Mommy Needs a Break Nation. We love y'all. Yes. <laughs>